In the early 1950s, North American Aviation used the airframe of its successful F-100 Super Sabre to build a prototype for a U.S. Air Force all-weather fighter-bomber competition. The result was the F-107A Ultra Sabre, or Man-Eater, a nickname it earned due to the aircraft's unique overhead jet intake located just above the cockpit. This configuration allowed the F-107 to carry additional ordnance under its belly, including four 20mm cannons and up to 4,000 pounds worth of conventional bombs or atomic payload. The Ultra Sabre also attracted the attention of the Air Force because of its all-moving vertical fin and Mach 2 capabilities, and was their first fighter capable of supersonic speed in level flight. Still, it never went into production, resulting in one of the greatest military debacles of all time. A Tactical Fighter As the end of the Korean War approached in early 1953, the North American Aircraft Company studied different F-100 designs to assess if modifying the aircraft for other roles was suitable. Interceptor and fighter-bomber versions were suggested by members of the design team, but these were not the only ones. Still wanting to make an improved version of the standard F-100A tactical fighter, North American began working on the F-100B, a fighter-bomber. While the company worked on these prototype designs, the United States Air Force issued a request for a tactical fighter-bomber in 1954. The requirements included an aircraft capable of Mach 2 speeds and the capacity to carry the 1,680-pound Mark 7 tactical nuclear gravity bomb with an expanded arsenal of other smaller warheads. North American, which had already envisioned its own modified F-100 nuclear-capable fighter bomber, submitted its F-100B design. After analyzing the aircraft's design and features, the Air Force gave the green light to build three prototypes in June of 1954. If production went smoothly, the Air Force would then award North American a contract to build 33 aircraft. However, North American quickly realized that the changes required to fulfill the requests for air superiority and night fighter with this tactical fighter bomber were more significant than initially thought. The company thus changed the F-100B designation to F-107A in July of 1954 to reflect the F-100 Super Sabre design changes. The F-107A Ultra Sabre the primary changes included a longer fuselage to house the bomb load, a unique all-moving vertical fin, a futuristic air intake above the cockpit, an automated flight control system, and a variable area inlet duct that automatically controlled the air fed to the aircraft's turbojet engine. To fulfill the request of the Air Force to carry a nuclear payload, the nose-mounted engine air intake in the F-107A had to be removed and changed for an innovative variable area inlet duct located directly above the cockpit. The result was a recessed weapons bay under the fuselage to store a nuclear device or an additional tank fuel. As this added space in the aircraft's belly suddenly became an internal bomb bay, half of the atomic ordnance was visible. The unusual configuration earned the F-107A the nickname Man-Eater, in reference to the air intake located directly above the cockpit. Although this peculiar and futuristic-looking air intake limited rear visibility, North American engineers paid no attention to it, for it was not a level 1 priority for a tactical fighter-bomber aircraft. It was assumed that air combat would happen with guided missile exchanges out of the pilot's visual range. Due to the air intake placement directly above the cockpit, the pilot had to squeeze into it through a unique vertical opening canopy rather than a conventional hinged one. And the ejection seat was designed to blast right through the canopy during an emergency, there was no need of jettisoning it first. The main armament was somewhat similar between both aircraft. Like the F-100, the Maneater was equipped with six underwing pylons placed underneath the wings to carry other ordnance, and its maximum bomb load capacity was 10,000 pounds. When it came to guns, the F-107A Maneater could either carry four 20mm Pontiac M39 cannons or one 20mm six-barrel M61 Vulcan autocannon. The other contrasting difference between the Maneater and the F-100 Sabre involved the all-moving vertical fin and the automated flight control system. These features allowed the F-107A to roll at supersonic speeds using spoilers. A future upgrade would include the addition of pitch and yaw dampers. The aircraft was powered by one Pratt & Whitney YJ-75 P9 turbojet with 24,500 pounds of thrust, which was 50% more potent than the standard F-100 Sabre. It also included single-point refueling capability while a retractable tail skid was installed. The F-107A was 61 feet long with a 36-foot wingspan and a height of 19 feet, and its maximum takeoff weight was 41,500 pounds. In contrast, 
the F-100 Sabre was 50 feet long, with a 38-foot wingspan and a height of 16 feet, and its maximum takeoff weight was 34,800 pounds. As the Maneater had a more powerful engine, it was capable of Mach 2 speeds at a maximum range of 2,430 miles. The F-100 Sabre could only reach Mach 1.4 speeds at an estimated range of 1,995 miles. An unexpected winner. While North American was finishing the first prototype, the company proposed a two-seat version of the F-107 in which two crew members would be seated in a single canopy in an extended forward fuselage. However, none would ever be built. In August of 1954, the Air Force confirmed that in addition to the three prototypes, the company was cleared for a pre-production order of six additional F-107As. The first F-107A prototype took to the skies on September 10, 1956 from Edwards Air Force Base in California, with North American's chief test pilot Bob Baker at the controls. Baker achieved a maximum speed of Mach 1.03 during flight. Although minor issues were reported, the brake parachute did not deploy, leading Baker to conduct a hot landing that damaged the nose gear. Still, the aircraft met all its goals. On November 3rd, Baker reached Mach 2 during another flight. The second prototype was delivered that same month. Equipped with its standard weaponry, including the bomb load, the prototype was tested on November 28th. No issues were detected. The third F-107A prototype was used to test the automatic variable area inlet duct, and it flew on December 10th, 1956. Test pilots reported some bugs during testing, such as a buzz in the variable geometry duct. However, pilots enthusiastically praised the aircraft, and they often joked about being swallowed by the air intake. After the final tests were conducted, Tactical Air Command decided to fly a runoff competition between the F-107 and its competitor, the Republic F-105 Thunder Chief. This aircraft used the same engine and was designed for the same tactical bomber missions. But while the F-107 had succeeded during its flight tests, the F-105 had a troubled testing phase. As North American was busy producing other aircraft, such as the XF-108 Rapier long-range interceptor, Republic was going through a rough patch. Its once successful F-84 series was approaching its end, and Republic desperately needed a new contract. However, the company believed that its F-105 was the underdog when compared to the Maneater. The company's test pilots were told to prepare to embrace the F-107, as there was a likely possibility that the Air Force might arrange a subcontract for Republic to manufacture it. During an interview with Defense Network, Republic test pilot Henry Crescabine recalled, quote, our perception was that the Air Force liked North American, and liked North American's design better than ours. To everyone's surprise, and after months of discussion, the Air Force finally awarded the contract to Republic in March of 1957. Although the Maneater was the better aircraft, the Air Force ultimately settled for the Thunder Chief because it had a whole internal bomb bay and could carry 40% more ordnance than the F-107A. Another reason that helped the Thunder Chief was that North American was already busy with its other projects, and the Air Force believed that they would not be able to deliver the aircraft on time. The three F-107A prototypes were eventually used for test flights, but the program's end was imminent. The prototypes were then leased to the predecessor of NASA, the National Advisory Committee for Aeronautics, for high-speed flight research and other aircraft research. The F-107's variable intake attracted the institution's attention, and they wanted to investigate its mechanics. As for the intake duct, NASA engineers had to use a fixed intake to avoid mechanical problems. After numerous setbacks with the first prototype, NACA grounded it and decided to use it as a spares donor for the other two aircraft. Then, during a test flight, pilot Scott Crossfield encountered mechanical problems during takeoff and crashed the F-107A, destroying the tires and setting off a small brake fire. The prototype was ultimately scrapped, and the other two were sent to the Pima Air Museum in Tucson, Arizona, and the Air Force Museum in Dayton, Ohio. As for the F-105 Thunder Chief, it went overseas to fight America's next conflict, the Vietnam War, where it achieved legendary status. Thank you for watching my video. Please like and subscribe to our Dark Documentaries channels to find more exciting historical content. And let us know in the comments below what you think of the multi-role capabilities of the F-107A Ultra Saber. Did the prototype have a chance against the Republic F-105 Thunder Chief?